Honorable First Lady Eliza Reid, distinguished authors Kristin Eriksdóttir and Thora Hjörleifsdóttir, and dear virtual guests across the Atlantic, I would like to warmly welcome you to this live streamed literature event from Harpa Concert Hall in the Harpa of Reykjavik City Centre. This event is a first for us, a collaboration between our embassies in Washington, London and Ottawa, and our Consulates General in Winnipeg and New York. I would, also, uh, I would also like to thank Iceland naturally for contributing to this event, ARPA, the Association of Icelandic Publishers, Brindis Lofstotter in particular, the Icelandic Literary, Li Literature Centre and our co-hosts, National Nordic Museum in Seattle and Scandinavia House in New York. A virtual world can, in sense, bring us closer together and we are hoping that, with this effort, we can reach a wide audience for a discussion on a topic that is close to most Icelanders' heart, Icelandic literature. Our guest of honour, first speaker, needs no presentation to our Icelandic audience. First Lady Eliza Reid, who is also a writer and editor herself and the co-founder of the Great Iceland Writers' Retreat. Eliza will give a talk about the Icelandic literature scene and what makes Iceland so unique and inspirational both as a home and as a travel destination for lovers of the written word. Following Eliza's opening presentation, she will be joined by two of the most bracing voices on Icelandic literary scene today, Thora Hjörleifsdóttir and Kristín Eriksdóttir. Thora is an Icelandic writer and poet born in 1986. She has published three books of poetry with her poetry collective Impostor Poets, or Svikaskald, and her first novel, Magma, or Kvika, was published in, Iceland in, uh, pu published in Iceland 2019 with critical and commercial acclaim. Magma has been picked up by Grove Atlantic in the USA and Picador in the UK, and the English translation will be published in March 2021. Kristin is an Icelandic poet and author born in 1981. Kristin's debut was in 2004, and since then, she has published eight books in Iceland, poetry, short stories, novels, and four of, our play, of her plays have been staged in the National Theatre of Iceland, the Reykjavik City Theatre, and on the radio. Last year, she made her English language debu debut with a novel, a, a f a f f with a novel, A Fist or a Heart, published by Amazon Crossing. Thora and Kristin will read a short passage from their novels and talk about their works. Following their presentations, we'll have a short discussion with the three guests in which you will get a chance to ask what you would like to know about their work and the Icelandic literary scene. Simply post a question in a comment on the live stream. I will not take more time from our interesting panel and I will ask First Lady Eliza Reid to take the floor. Hi everybody around the world. It's really exciting to be here today and to have an opportunity to say a few words with you and to give you a very brief little introduction to Icelandic literature before we hear from our Icelandic authors later. As you can probably hear from my voice, um, English is my first language. I was not born and raised in Iceland. I was born and raised in Canada. And one of the things that I like to say about that is that gives me a kind of unique perspective on Icelandic society and Icelandic literature that I might not have had if I had been born and raised in this country. And one of the things that I love most about our society here is the immense admiration and respect with which we hold our writers and really with which we hold all of the people who work in the cultural fields here where we realize how important the cultural fields are to, to all of us. Maybe some of you who are tuning in today already know about the statistics that you've heard about Icelandic book publishing and book writing, that we have some of the highest book publishing and book buying rates per capita in the world. 
Although I should also add that because we have a population of 350,000, we have the most per capita statistics per capita in the world. So it maybe is a little bit less impressive for you. But nevertheless, here in Iceland, we have a lot of people who are writing a lot of books and expressing themselves all the time. We even have another phrase that you can practice while you're watching this, uh, which means to walk with a book in your belly, meaning that so many Icelanders have a story that we're waiting to, to set free and to release to the world. So in these very few brief remarks that I'll be doing today, I just wanted to cover a little bit of the history of why it is that we have such a respect and admiration for the written word here in Iceland. Then I'll talk a little bit about what that means for us today. And for all of you people around the world, for all of you friends of Iceland, maybe a couple of little things on how you can experience that from the comfort of your own homes. So to start with a little bit of background of here in Iceland literature, our Sögu Eya, our story island, as we like to call it, there has always been an important emphasis on literacy and literature for both boys and girls throughout the centuries. But of course, what it is that people are so familiar with when it comes to books in Iceland are the Icelandic sagas. These are the stories that were written in between the 12th and 14th centuries about times past in Iceland, and they have everything the good stories have. They have romance, they have war, they have conflict, they have resolution, they have beautiful nature, sometimes really long run-on paragraphs. But they have inspired writers and musicians and poets from around the world to the present day, and they're something that we're very proud of here. If you can imagine this island, this isolated North Atlantic island for centuries and centuries, which was very impoverished. We didn't have the materials here to build huge churches. We couldn't paint fabulous paintings or even have musical instruments to have big orchestras, but we had the written word. And that sort of tradition is really what has lasted until today and helped to build up this respect for it. The sagas are what gives us confidence as writers said writer Harkimur Helgason once at a conference that I attended. And I think that this is very true and very indicative of how much of an influence that it has had on writers to the present day. Another writer, an Iceland friend, British author David Mitchell, wrote in the UK's Independence paper, in, in, Independent, a poetic bent and a gift for wordplay seem to be cool rather than nerdish in Iceland. And the medieval sagas feed this legacy. For Iceland, they are textual treasure. If we jump way ahead then to the 20th century, because I'm only talking for a few minutes, we can see where books became popular to give as gifts. And even still today, the book is the most popular Christmas present. And in a few weeks here in Iceland, we'll be getting in our mailboxes a catalog with all of the books that are going to be published in the season leading up to Christmas. And in that book, we loved, it's like getting the Ikea catalog at home. We pour through it and everybody circles the books that they want to get for Christmas. And that is the beginning of the so-called Christmas book flood, when the vast majority of the books that are sold to the country are sold during this Christmas season. And when there isn't a pandemic, there's lots of different events going on where authors are able to read for people and introduce their works. We also got international attention maybe in the 20th century when Iceland won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1953 or Icelandic author Haldor Laxness won. I said at the beginning, uh, I talked about per capita statistics and I always like to say that that makes Iceland the country with the most Nobel Prizes per capita. But I actually have to be corrected on that because the Faroe Islands have had a winner, although not in the, in the category of literature. So that's kind of the history very, very quickly. In a nutshell, we here in Iceland have a society that values and appreciates and respects literature and the written word very much. Uh, the Christmas book flood is still very important to all of us here. So if you're a writer, what does that mean for you? That means that your profession is seen with respect. And that means that you can apply for grants uh, through the government to be able to eke out a living or to support your income as a writer, as you can if you pursue any numerous other types of, of creative passions. There's also a strong writers union here. And again, many different and creative opportunities to promote your books when they come out. I know my husband has published a few books before he was president, and he has delivered talks for his books everywhere from fish factories to our outdoor geothermal hot tubs. And it's a great environment when people come together and really like to, to talk about books and read a lot of books. 
So to all of you around the world, all of you friends of Iceland who, who come from all over the place, how can you benefit for that? Um, if you are an armchair friend right now, which basically pretty much everyone in the world is, that means that there's no better way really to get to know Icelandic culture, well maybe also eating Icelandic food, but to get to know Icelandic culture by buying a book and reading works by Icelandic authors from old to new and all genders and times and types of stories. And I think if there, there's never really been a better time to be buying more books, to be supporting writers, and to be broadening your minds about the outside world as well. But one day, when I hope you're all able to visit Iceland in person, and if you like to write and you enjoy the written word, there's of course a lot of ways to enjoy that here in Iceland. Obviously, as you can see from behind me today, well, this is what we call window weather. It's really not nearly as warm or as pleasant actually outside as it looks like from the window. But if you're a writer, you can be in a snowstorm, you can be in the dark of winter or the, the 24 hour sunlight of summer or under the northern lights. It's all wonderful and inspirational. You can take advantage of attending various festivals and events that we host throughout Iceland during the year. You can drive around the country and even visit different museums that communities have set up to be able to showcase the lives of different authors who grew up in those communities. We do need to improve there by having more of them that commemorate the works of female authors, but we're getting there. But it's still amazing to travel around the country and see these different locations. For Iceland's former president, Oliver Ragnar Grimson, once spoke and said to us that in Reykjavik, you can see more statues of writers than you do of politicians. I haven't gone to actually go and fact check that myself, but again, I think that shows an indication of the amount of respect that there is for this type of profession here. I also always remember the story of a woman who attended the Iceland Writers Retreat in the first year. She was a writer from New Jersey who really enjoyed the craft of writing and was making her first trip to Iceland. And she said to me, you know, one day I went into this cafe in Reykjavik and I started chatting with someone and they said to me, so what do you do? And I said, I was a writer. And usually when I'm in New Jersey, everybody says to me, oh, no, 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 what's your real job? Or they say to me, how can you earn a living doing that? Or they say, oh, you are like a brochure writer or what? And this woman said to me, but when I was in Reykjavik and I was at the cafe and I said I was a writer, this person right away said, oh, that's fantastic. Tell me what it is that you're working on. And that's something that she really took with her from the country was that idea and that interest of the contribution that all storytellers can be making to society. I just wanted to end with one quote from you from Pulitzer Prize winning author Geraldine Brooks who taught at our Iceland Writers Retreat the first year who had this to say about her first visit to Iceland. She wrote, Iceland is the most creatively stimulating place I have ever set foot. The landscape is so otherworldly that it forces you to see with fresh eyes. And being in a culture that's so rich in literature is remarkable. The depth and breadth of the writing tradition and the modern commitment to literature is breathtaking. Riding amazing Icelandic horses over the lava fields, listening to extraordinary live music in some of the friendliest, chillest bars I've had the pleasure to visit, seeing Gutfoss and Geysir, feeling the tingling shock of the hot springs. I can't mention a highlight because the entire time was a high. I hope all of you get to experience that in person someday, but in the meantime and continuing on for that, I hope all of you get to experience a little bit of a taste of Iceland by buying and reading some books by Icelandic authors. Thanks very much. Hope you enjoy the rest of the panel. Thank Elisa. My name is Thora Hjörlesdóttir and I am an Icelandic writer. I've written three books of poetry and just last year I published my first novel called Magma. And, uh, and I've, it's been a bit of a whirlwind for me after that because the book came out in February and I was invited to partake in a literary festival in the, just in the following months, in April I think it was. And after that I got a book deal in the States. So I think I'm, you know, uh, I think it's it's not a, a an unusual. Uh, it's a, like I think I'm unusually lucky, and sometimes I worry that I might be a one-hit wonder, but we will just have to see about that. <laughs> um, and the book that I wrote, Magma, uh, it's 
It's like Elisa said, it's, it's, it's a book that was in my stomach for a very long time and I was thinking about it for years, how I wanted to write it and how I wanted to present it. And, and then the Me Too movement happened and that was somewhere around 2017. And in Iceland, at least in Facebook, there were women who were writing uh, so many, so many stories about uh, abuse they experienced in intimate relationships. And it was abuse that was often very invisible, that you couldn't really see because nobody really hit anyone. Or no, and, and, the thing, and, they, and the abuse didn't leave any marks because it was emotional or sexual. And it was so shocking for me to see how, how common these stories were, like how many women came in, chimed in and said the story, like uh, th their stories again and again. And, and, uh, and I don't want to make light of abuse or abusive situations, but I read through this and I thought to myself, oh my God, being an, ab an, an abuser is like being an, a, a cliche because the stories, they were always, uh, there were so many repetitions, so many things that were said again and again and again, but in different situations and in different homes. And I thought to myself that this is what I want to write about. I wanted to write about uh, a young woman who falls in love and, uh, and doesn't even realize that the man that she's so taken with is abusing her because she's just so smitten with him. And the theme that I was really fascinated about when I was writing this as well was that uh, is, is, the, is what happens when you take a young woman who has been watching Disney movies and romantic comedies her entire life and she believes in just, you know, being nice and being understanding and, you know, when, uh, and for example, when I was growing up, Beauty and the Beast was my favorite Disney movie. And th there in the story, Beauty goes into the castle of the beast. And I mean, the beast is scary as hell, but in the end, she is just so nice and treats the cutlery nicely as well. So she gets eternal love. Yay, what a result. And then, uh, so we have the Disney girl who has been watching Disney movies and romantic comedies. And, and, and in the book, I was, exploring what happens when she meets a man or a young man who has been watching pornography since he was a young boy or a teenager. And because uh, it seems in, our, in the culture of young people that when people start to hook up and be together that the, 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 the influence of porn is, is constantly there because porn pre prescribes uh, like pre uh, presents a sort of a script of like how sex is supposed to be and how like the man is supposed to perform and how the woman is supposed to perform and then uh, yeah so that was something that I wanted to write about when I wrote Magma and I think that I think I'm just going to read uh, yeah no okay I'm also going to tell you the name of the main character uh, her name is Lilia, and she is, you know, 20 something. And in the beginning of the book, she is, she is very adventurous and lively and really a really big free spirit. And she meets a guy that she really likes. And, uh, and she wants to become his girlfriend, but he constantly rejects her. Like he wants to keep her around, but not really like commit. And Lilia, she is sure that if she just sticks with him, that she will show him how worthy she is of his love. So I have a few chapters here that I'm going to read from the novel. And the first chapter I'm going to read is the first chapter from the book called Chlamydia. I didn't know it would be such a big deal. It's not like it's incurable nobody's going to die, we'll take antibiotics and then, 10 days later, it will be gone. But now he thinks I'm a total slut and I must be since I've infected people. But I think he's being unfair. It shouldn't ma matter this much. 
He acts as if I've, re I've rejected him because I've been with other men. We weren't together when I went to Central America. We'd gone on one date and I hadn't even slept with him. I was traveling alone, so I slept around because I had nothing better to do and I needed to fill in the gaps. I didn't know that something would grow between us. In fact, I thought it would never happen. But I became more and more taken with him as I traveled. He sent me near constant emails and he was always ready to talk when I went to internet cafes. We just started to connect. When I came home, we clicked. I fell head over heels. He's beautiful and smart. I don't know how many books he owns. Hundreds. He has this crazy, and, and he has this crazy DVD collection. But the chlamydia kept eating at him. He wouldn't stop interrogating me about the other boys. I held back at first. I only told him about one guy, a Norwegian in Cuba. And then I added the next one to the list, followed by the third, the fourth, the fifth. Fuck, I can't be expected to remember everything. I tried to explain that my memory isn't really that great, but he thinks I'm lying. We were gliding on a smooth current, and now he wants nothing to do with me. Hygiene. It's a new chapter. <laughs> when I shower at his place, he always wants to get in with me. We've showered together so often that he seems quite hurt if I say I'd like to shower alone. The shower is really tight with two people, especially when I wash my hair, but he thinks it's cozy and I want him to be happy. Sometimes when he shower, he asks if he can pee on me. Urine feels, feels strange when it runs down your body. It's colder than the water and the smell that cooks in the heat and steam isn't especially pleasant. He usually wants to piss on my back, but sometimes he wants me to rest on my knees while he pees over my head. Once he peed in my mouth, I didn't like that, but the other times, but I don't mind the other times as much as I'm already in the shower and can rinse it right off. Uh, I'm going to read two more chapters, short chapters. Uh, and I'm sorry, internet, for being so vulgar, but this is, this is what, what's everywhere on the internet. So I'm, yeah. Uh, and I've already said sorry to my grandmother who read the book. So, uh, the next chapter, Butthole. We were watching a film, cuddled up on the couch when he first asked if he could maybe, possibly, someday, fuck me up the ass. I thought at first that he was joking. Nobody wants to do that. Not really. I know that one of my friends did it and she said it was disgusting. And I've heard that it's pretty dangerous. Sarum's mom is a nurse and she's told her horror stories about teenage girls who come into the emergency room with torn sphincters because of rough anal. They have to wear diapers for the rest of their lives because they have no control of their bowel movements. The shit just spills out. I understand that gay men make do with their situation by penetrating each other, but straight men with healthy women in their beds, women who have vaginas, mouths and hands, should really count their blessings. And finally, words. He's a master at turning my words against me. He remembers everything better than I do. He just takes the most uncharacteristic things I've said out of context and frames them in an unflattering way. When we fight, he bombards me with my own words. Then I feel like a girl who's cut off her arms and handed them to him in complete trust. Now he's using my own lifeless limbs to hurt me. Uh, these were a few chapters from Magma that will be published next March in English-speaking countries. Thank you.
Hi. Hi. Um, grateful to be here. Um, so my name is Kristin Eristóttir and I plan to talk about um, my first novel to be uh, published in, in English in English and um, it's called The Fist or Heart and it's translated by Larissa Kaiser. Um, first I want to talk about the book a little bit before reading a short chapter from it. Um, the narrator is um, born in the 40s. Um, she um, makes props and prosthetics for um, mostly movies and also for theater. And um, yes, and she's um, telling her um, her own story, but uh, maybe through her surroundings in a way. Um, because that is her way of relating to the world through uh, material. Um, but in this story, she is losing uh, grips a little bit um, on reality. Um, but um, I've worked a lot in my previous writings. I've, I've worked a lot with the, the uh, unreliable narrator. Um, and I've thought a lot about uh, reliability um, in general and, and, and that uh, maybe people's experience of, of reality isn't reliable um, ever. Um, and that we only have our own interpretation of it and that we should take good care of it and guard it. Um, but I, I, I don't know, um, I think I'm going to read, so there's another main character of the, uh, in the book that is uh, a young playwright. She is 20 years old, uh, so she's a lot younger than the narrator and, and um, she is a playwright, so they get to know each other through um, a production at the theater. Um, and I'm going to um, read to you uh, a short chapter from the beginning. The real estate agent called and told me that they'd found a cold little storage room in my grandma's old house that wasn't on any of the blueprints and that in it there were three boxes with my name on them. It was odd. I had never considered what had become of my belongings from my childhood and teenage years. It was like I assumed they'd just vanished of their own volition. Some things I'd thrown out, other things were lost. The rest had maybe gotten mixed in with someone else's stuff or had left home, like me. But there were three boxes, said the real estate agent, boxes that someone must have specially sorted. Alien papers, alien books, alien miscellaneous. Alien is the narrator's name. In addition to these three boxes, there were a few boxes of books in the storage room, a pile of tablecloths and embroidery, broken audio equipment, dust, mouse droppings and spider webs. I tried to avoid everything concerning that apartment, just hired a property manager and paid the bills, and now it was empty, spotlessly white, with a gleaming floor and pictures of it had run in the newspaper's real estate pages. Everything was ready when the storage unit in the basement came to light. I don't even have a broom, I apologize, after we'd stacked the boxes in the back seat of my car. The real estate agent waved that away, said she'd take care of it. She was on edge, as if she were selling her first property or wasn't a real estate agent at all young and fast-talking, as if she were performing the idea of a man. On my way home, I listened to the news on the radio. Police were seeking information on the whereabouts of a pale man wearing a parka and gloves. It was the beginning of February and dark. I wondered who wouldn't be pale and wearing a parka and gloves right now. Back at home, Ellen's 
script, Ellen is the young playwright. Back at home, Ellen's script was waiting for me unread. The script for the play that would be staged in the fall. Rumor had it that it was completely finished, that its construction was perfect, and that if the director tried to change as much as a comma, the whole thing would go to pieces. By all accounts, its characterization was unprecedent <laughs> unprecedentedly <laughs> vivid, its style exceptional, sorry. I flipped straight to the character descriptions and squinted at the page. The father, a splotch of bandages, some of them sodden, yet nothing is wrong. It had been a long time since I'd gone near a theater. When I was younger, I sometimes worked in the prop department for short periods of time. But for the last 30 years, I'd really only worked in film and television. Reidar, the director who was going to stage the young genius's play, had mostly made movies, even though, like me, he'd gotten his start in the theater. I'd worked with him often. Now he was a middle-aged man and had been known as the next big thing for the past 20 years. When he'd called and asked if I had time, my first reaction was to say no. Mainly because I'd become so consumed with close-ups, minutia, perfection, with materials that were like skin, with nuances, with this kind of hyper-delicacy. The degree of concentration that this precision demanded was addictive. In the theater, everyone could care less about that. Movements needed to be large enough that the people in the very back could see them, as did the costumes. The props badly painted styrofoam and particle board, if I recalled correctly. Just read the script, said Tredar. You're going to love the descriptions. It's perfect for a modernist like you. We've just got to have you on the team. You're going to love it. I promise. You're going to love it, I promise, he said. And I was going to say goodbye when he dropped the young genius's name. Ellen Alvstotter, he said. Alvur Finsson's daughter, I asked. Yes, that's right, he said. Quite a selling point. We've got the big stage, plenty of money, that's why I'm calling you. Send me the play, I said. And in almost the same moment, I received a new email. I printed the script right away, but since then, it had wandered unread between the kitchen table and the living room couch. I was overcome with the fatigue, particular to the short days of winter, and got to my feet, went into the living room, Everything was a mess. My workroom was constantly eating up square footage in the house. There were many pounds of clay underneath a thick plastic sheet on, on the dining table, curving up out of the middle of the clay and sticking through a hole cut in the plastic was a horn that I was shaping. The horn was supposed to look like a rhinoceros horn that played a big part in a movie that was to be shot over the summer but the director didn't want to use a real horn for political, polit for political reasons. Yeah. Um, so that was my last sentence. I, I'll say it again, for political reasons. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Christine and uh, Thora and Eliza. It's been great to listen to all of you. Such powerful pieces you've been reading from your works. And I'm incredibly happy to see how many people have tuned into this broadcast all over the world. Uh, let me remind you that uh, now you can ask our contributors anything you like. Just simply post a question in the live, live stream you're watching from. But uh, as a moderator, I'm going to take the privilege to ask the first question. And uh, I will ask our first lady, Eliza Reed. Uh, today, you are joined, by this, uh, joined on this panel by two young women that are already known names in, in the literature world of Iceland. Uh, I think you phrased it so nicely in your talk, but in Iceland, it was more a question of 
that it was cool rather nerdy mm. to uh, to be a, a writer okay. uh, and so let me ask, do you think Iceland, in, uh, that Icelandic authors, given the role of literature in, in Iceland and the relative fame of mm. authors mm -hmm. in the country, that they may have easier or, or better access to publishers? That's a good question, Svet. I think, you know, in Iceland, we're so many people that everybody wears a lot of hats in Iceland. So I think you maybe are, um, you're a writer, but you're also an accountant and you play in a band and you do all these other kinds of things. And somehow we all manage to, to make the country run in that way. But I think, you know, as I was discussing, because the, the writer, being a writer is seen the word that's coming to mind right now is dignity, you know, with such dignity, the importance of telling all kinds of stories. I think within Iceland, because we're a small society, if you have a book that you want to publish, you can maybe get in touch with somebody, but the standard is still very high. By no means does it mean that anything you can write up just right away gets published on the shelves. Um, I think in personal experience, maybe Thor and Christine can comment a little bit about their their journey to, to be published as well? Yeah, um, for me, because I'm a part of a poetry collective and poetry, yeah, you're always, uh, I'm, I'm looking for an English word, but you're always a bit of an underdog in the publishing world if you, when you <laughs> write poetry, mm -hmm. uh, but not in the spiritual world. <laughs> <Not like that. laughs> uh, no, so, um, yeah, so I, I belong to a poetry collective and we are six women and we were all, we had all written poetry and written, written fiction for a, for a while when we got together and we figured, found out that we were all very plagued by the feeling that whatever we were writing would never be good enough. Mm -hmm. And we always ha and there's always this pressure of like the first work, the first book, the, the debut, like what's that going to be? And we were, um, very nervous about that. And we decided that instead of pr producing something perfect, we would actually write a book that wouldn't be perfect ourselves and publish it ourselves and just rip the bandaid off and have the first book out in the world. And then uh, no matter like the, how that would go, then that would just be done. And then we can get on with business and mm. do other writing. Uh, so we, and that, that's where the small, uh, the, the smallness of the nation came in handy because it was so easy to call a friend who was an editor and be like, hey, we have a poetry manuscript, but re read it for us. And call a graphic designer and call like a printer and be like, D -d -d -d. and then in like just a few weeks, we had the book ready. So, and it was actually a good book, even though I say so myself. So, <laughs> uh, so that's how I started actually with the self publishing and then, um, and you can't really say that in foreign countries, that you've self-published, then you're a no-no, but uh, you're an untouchable if you do that. But mm -hmm. here, like, if, if your materi material is good, then it doesn't matter really where it comes from, so if it comes from a publishing house or from your living room. So, Christine, what are your thoughts on this? Your trajectory from uh, being, of course, unknown like everybody when they start, uh, to receive the, the Icelandic Literary Prize and uh, get it translated into foreign languages. Uh, is that uh, the, what uh, Thora was describing? Is that something that you're familiar with? Uh, I think, I think uh, Icelandic writers like uh, Eliza has been talking about um, are very privileged, uh, extremely privileged, uh, because, and it has to do with our language. Um, uh, because languages die out every day. Uh, so Icelanders are afraid to lose Icelandic, the language. So, uh, so obviously you're going to be willing to, uh, to nurture literature um, in order for it to, uh, to uh, keep all of its words. Because that is so interesting when you have such a small language. It's, it's sort of, of course the, the language will always be changing, it's fluid but you don't want it to lose the words. You want it to uh, you know, add new words. You want to you know, take in the, the, all of the English words, which we do, but not lose the other ones, the old ones. And I think it's, it, it, yeah, you're, I mean, it's, it's a very intimate relationship with language to, to be a writer. And so, um, and so um, 
writers tend to use more words to, to keep them in the, and then there are lots of readers as well, so, th so that is great. So yes, it's, but it's difficult, there's everywhere you need to be a good writer in order to, um, to get readers. So, um, so um, yeah, and in Iceland it has a lot to do with, uh, I mean, without translators, it, we are just completely isolated. And there aren't very many people who get the idea of, of, of becoming translators from Icelandic. But fortunately there are some excellent ones. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, the, yeah. the, uh, we just received a question from the audience that ties mm -hmm. nicely in with what you're saying, oh. uh, and it's uh, from Julie, mm -hmm. I'm not sure wh where she is from, but uh, she asks, uh, when your work is translated into other languages, and it's for both of you, mm -hmm. uh, do you find it loses something of the expressive beauty of your own language? I mean, is it, and is it difficult to find a translator whose style can reflect your own? Christy? It, it is, and there are some excellent translators, and they are gems. We Icelandic <laughs> writers are, you know, we love them so much because there are not many of them. Um, so if any anyone needs a job, here's here's an idea. Um, not not anyone though, because it's it's pretty hard. Uh, so I was so lucky, and uh, with with my translator uh, Larissa Kaiser, who is a young translator. She's she's new, and and I think she did a marvelous job with my book, um, and I'm very happy with her translation. Um, so that is extremely important, but it's a different book, and that's what happens with all translations. That is the, I mean, and, and f in order to be a good translator, you you are a poet. You are adding your own voice to the to the. It becomes um, two, there are two tones, and there's a new voice in it. So so and and yeah, it's it's all of these sort of chances also if it goes well together and yeah. What about you, Zara? It was uh, the the, uh, the chapters you read earlier were incredibly strong, they had very strong language. Uh, for you to have it translated from Icelandic into English and uh, getting back to the question we got, just got earlier, uh, is it difficult for you to, uh, to make the transition from the Icelandic to English? Um, like Christine, I actually al was also s very lucky with the translator and I also got a young woman to translate for me whose name is Mac Matis and she did a, an amazing job on my translation. And it was uh, very collaborative, or maybe I was just being a very like, bossy writer or the author being like, I want to, con I want to partake. Like, so, but she, she is, and also because Magma is a very like, poetic novel, so I was very lucky that Mac has a really good sense for it and is a poet herself. So, uh, yeah, so I really lucked out with her, but I think that, uh, when you translate something between languages, because language as an entity is thought. So I think differently in Icelandic than I would in English because, of we, because we have different vocabulary for different things. So I think it's a very fascinating art to uh, take a, a work of literature and move it from Icelandic to another language. So your thoughts, you've been uh, bringing the, our literary heritage to a wider audience mm -hmm. uh, and to that, uh, to that end, yeah. uh, translations are, of course, extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, how important are they in, in, to, to, to build these cultural bridges? I mean, absolutely, the translations are very important. And, you know, as Christine was saying, not that many people around the world speak and read Icelandic. So I think if people want to hear these stories, they need to be, tra sorry, they need to be translated into different languages. Um, and, you know, it's the, it's the flip side of the, this, this positive idea that it's great that there's an increase in Icelandic literature, you know, everything from crime fiction to literary fiction and nonfiction and all kinds of treaties. But the, the challenge that arises from that is that more people want to publish it into more languages. And so I will echo what Kristen says, that we need more translators in, into all kinds of languages. Because even if you're translating something into Arabic or Russian or Lithuanian or Portuguese or anything, very often now, those translators are using the English translation of the book. And again, it adapts a little bit more. So we have some really 
wonderful translators who are translating, say, from Icelandic into Polish or Icelandic into Swedish or something like that. And they're, they're really well known and sought after in the, in the community. And so I would encourage, again, people to do that. There's definitely a demand for it, I think. Exactly. Uh, to, uh, let me remind you of ga again to post a question uh, in the live stream if you want to ask our, uh, our guests today to, to answer your questions. Uh, just, uh, I would like to know a little bit more about your books. Uh, Thought of your book that you read uh, a passage earlier from, Magma, it's an intimate uh, description of a violent relationship. We got a glimpse of that earlier, for sure. But why did you choose to write about such almost uncomfortable topic? Mm. I chose to, wrote, to write this very uncomfortable book. Uh, well, I, I wrote it because I felt like I had to. And, and when, I, when I was actually done with the manuscript, I got horrible second thoughts because like, like Eliza said, we all have, have many hats in Iceland. And I work as an elementary school teacher. <laughs> And I, I had this manuscript in my hands and I was just like, everybody's going to think I'm a pervert. I'm going to lose my job. Like everything is over if I publish this and my grandmother is going to read yeah, it. <laughs> Still part of, what did your grandmother say? I mean, what, what was your, her reaction to the book? Uh, my grandmother said that it was very powerful. And then she said, I hope it's not about you. And I said, no, grandma, don't worry. Hmm. So that was a, and then we haven't really discussed it any further. So that was a good good talk we had. <laughs> uh, yeah, but for me, I think that uh, if we want to become, uh, if we want to like figure things out and get a grasp on the, ar around them, like uh, domestic violence and uh, sexual abuse and intimate relationships, you just we have to dive into the underworld and turn every stone and just look at the horror that we have there. And then by doing that, then we can become uh, educated and, uh, and enlightened and turn back to the world and have a better society. So that was, that was my hope for writing it. Christine, a fist or a heart, uh, you read earlier from that. Both the characters in the, in the book uh, are connected to the world of theatre, one in the form of stories and the other in the form of creating an uh, artificial world in the form of props. Uh, what is the meaning of uh, theatre and fiction in the, in the story? Uh, I think the reason why this sort of staging came up for me, because I've, I've worked in theatre or I've written for theatre. Um, and as a playwright, you're sort of on the, you're not really in that sort of environment, you're sort of on this, um, but you get to, to look in and it's so interesting. And I think, especially with the, the people who, all of, all of these sort of, like the, the people who make the props and, and the prosthetics, it's such an interesting job they do. And, and um, also my, my background, I, I, stu my, I studied visual arts. So, so I was also, you know, these sort of very her job is very sort of um, s sculptural or, or sort of so I was I was uh, uh, yeah um, and then it sort of turned out to to become the story in a way but I I don't really I didn't really know how how it at all yeah mm. the setting sort of makes the story yeah, sometimes yeah. and your book of course got the Icelandic Literary Prize in 2017 what difference did that make for you? both domestically and maybe more importantly, internationally. The, 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 the thing with prices is that uh, they are so important to Icelandic writers because that is when you get translated. It's sort of like you need that stamp on your book in order to get translated. So, um, you know, I had, had, I had gotten some nominations, but that's not enough. Here I got uh, this sort of, and then uh, it's been translated in, into, into more languages. And, so that's, and that is a, a major difference. Uh, for uh, for a, a writer in my position in, in this tiny uh, country with this enormous language, <laughs> um, so yeah, that that makes a difference uh, in that way. And um, yeah, and it, yeah. Ilusa, mm -hmm. you, you know a lot about promoting Icelandic literature yeah. abroad, and of course, Icelandic uh, crime 
books, yeah. crime stories, just like the, the whole Scandinavian mm -hmm. genre is, is very popular, has been for, for, yeah. for many years now. Mm -hmm. But what about uh, literature like these two women are, are mm -hmm. writing? Is it, does it, is it gaining attention uh, abroad? Yeah, I think everything, you know, with the, and the Iceland brand, if I can put it that way, uh, has some sort of appeal now. And I think if you're talking about marketing promotion of a country, in a sense, all of that sort of links together. So if you visit the country as a tourist and you do all kinds of things and you go hiking, you will be probably more interested in buying a book by an Icelandic author when you come back. And if you buy some skier when you're abroad, you might think, oh, that's interesting. If you hear about Iceland's policy, uh, you know, or emphasis on achieving gender equality, that makes you um, appeal things. And the same thing if you read an interesting story, uh, a story that makes you think, a story that makes you question things, you might be interested in finding out more. So they're all connected. And, you know, we see a big variety. As you mentioned, Svet, there's a lot of these the, the, the sort of Nordic noir wave that swept up. And of course, those, those sell many copies and they're very interesting. And the Icelandic noir within that have their own you know, way of expression. But it, you know, there's a huge diversity of literary fiction coming out here. There are Icelandic authors sometimes named when people are brainstorming who's gonna get the next Nobel Prize in literature. There's always Icelandic names that come up there. And you know, just as we have many different people, we have many different voices here and stories and ages that you know they're always going to touch upon something. Yeah, just uh, let me get, uh, since you had the word, yeah. there's a question from Karen Vines. Um, do you? Uh, I, don't, I, yeah. I, th I think you might be the correct one to answer <laughs> this question of uh, of three yeah. of us. Do you have some kind of some sort of writers group? Mm. I would love to connect with more people here. Karen says. Thank Is that you. something that you could Thank you, Karen, for the question. I know uh, at running the Iceland Writers Retreat, we get a lot of questions about that. And for the people who take part in our event, we always create like a closed group online for people to keep, be able to connect with each other. Um, otherwise, I think, you know, on our social media, we try to run different, um, you know, different opportunities for people, different, different events that we're hosting. Uh, people can apply for grants here and you can go and live in different sort of houses. I don't know of any like online... Iceland-based writers groups, especially that is not being conducted in Icelandic, which is a which is a barrier for people abroad. But there's a lot of resources in terms of learning more about the Icelandic language and that kind of thing. So it's just an idea. That Absolutely. Simply waits to be. Yes, Karen, maybe you can to, start one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Here's a, another question from uh, Karen Seiden uh, to the two authors. Uh, could you tell us about the types of Icelandic literature that you enjoy? What, what are the two of you reading? And Eliza, this of course applies to you as well. Um, I, I, I tend to read uh, a lot of poetry. So there, there are a lot of poets actually that I do enjoy. I really enjoy uh, Thora's group, uh, Svegaskald, the poster poet. Po um, yeah, and, and a lot of sort of new emerging uh, writers that I, I like. Um, yeah, so. Uh, Mm -hmm. What about you, Thor? What kind of Icelandic literature do you enjoy to read? Uh, like Christine, I really like to read poetry. And I've actually been a fangirl of Christine's for a really long time. So I'm very <laughs> happy to be here with her today. Yay. <laughs> uh, and so I recommend that you read Christine's book, A Fist or a Heart, available in many places No. Uh, and yeah, and yeah, there are so many great Icelandic writers. I also really like Sjón, uh, who is uh, an Icelandic writer who has a very good, uh, he's so good at mixing together mythology and uh, folklore and uh, weaving it into uh, fiction in a very interesting way. So I really like him as well. Can I also mention, because yeah. I didn't yeah. want to start naming names, yeah. because yeah. it's sort of, there are so many, yeah. but there, there has just been a, a book by also Kristin, Kristin Omarsdóttir. Uh, there, there has just been uh, translated a collection of her poetry, um, yeah, by Partus Press. Kristin Omarsdóttir, I really recommend that book. I know it's probably a yeah. sensitive issue for, yeah. for you, so I'm not going to put you on the spot to name uh, like yeah. any yeah. particular writer. Yeah. But just like generally speaking, what kind of literature do you, you know, like? like I mean, I love reading. I really like crime fiction, so I read a lot of the Icelandic crime fiction and lots of other things. And I also, 
I also really like nonfiction. And, and, and biography and memoir and political writing. And that's something that I kind of wish we had. We do have some translations like this uh, in Icelandic, um, you, you know, really, I know I shouldn't be naming people, you know, Andri Snær Magnusson is a really prominent writer on various kind of current affairs topics. Jón Gunnar, former mayor of Reykjavik, wrote a memoir in English. Like there are some, but there, that's an area where I think uh, in terms of English translations, we could expand a little bit. There's another question again from Julie. Uh, for the two, uh, two, two of you, that uh, do you feel that the Icelandic landscape and culture are almost an extra character in your narratives? Mm, not that I'm aware of. I'm still working on, you know, descriptions. And your book is called Magma. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you know. <laughs> So maybe next book I will have some descriptions of landscape, but I don't think actually there's there's very little, there are very few uh, descriptions of nature in my book. But I mean, the nature influences us, I think, in, in many ways here. So. Even the weather. Yeah. Christian, what about you? Uh, I think weather, I write a lot about the weather. I just realized this actually. I, I, I thought that I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here in Reykjavik. I, you know, I'm, I never write about land, but weather is 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 landscape somehow. Yeah, and we have so many words for weather also. Exactly. Um, we are almost done with this uh, excellent uh, webinar. It's been great to have you here. And uh, but before I let you go, I would like to uh, ask a little bit about the, about the future. What, what is in the pipelines for, for you? Uh, are you both working on new uh, books, whether it is poetry or, or novels? Can you share with us? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm writing for theater now. Um, I'm making an adaptation from uh, Virginia Woolf's Orlando. I'm really enjoying that. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm working on a novel that, that should be out next year. So. What about you, Sarah? Uh, I'm still looking for the next novel uh, and I, I was actually like looking so hard for it that I forgot everything else. So now I'm uh, taking a break from trying to write a novel and uh, I'm actually working on a, a documentary radio series about uh, an Ice Icelandic man and Italian millionaires who have been looking for the Holy Grail in Iceland. Oh. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit? Wow. It sounds too exciting to. Yeah. to leave I know, it I it's know. It's non-fiction, right? It's so non-fiction, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I have an uncle who is an architect, who is a very down-to-earth kind of guy, who has read a lot of the sagas, and he has, you know, different. He has a different take on what what has happened in those books, or, or what they're describing. And there's like a few things that he is very. Uh, he disagrees with like historians about what they're trying to uh, elaborate there. And uh, at almost 20 years ago, he got uh, an, an Italian guy got in contact with him who asked him, is it possible that crusaders could have come to Iceland in the years uh, 1215 to 1200 to 1230? Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, in fact, we have like, written uh, documentation of that in the sagas. So there starts the story. So, cool. yeah. Sounds very exciting. Uh, Elias, I'm, not, I'm yeah. not sure if you have a, like a book in the pipeline or any kind we of work, but what is, uh, what's, uh, what's on the horizon for you? Well, the Iceland Writers Retreat, which, is, which we hold every April, um, obviously we did not hold last April. And uh, it, so in a couple of weeks on October the 13th and 14th, we're gonna be hosting a couple of free online events, more panels with Icelandic authors. So uh, if anybody wants to follow more of that, uh, learning more with Icelandic uh, writers and poets and children's authors, then I would encourage them to tune in. We're all about webinar these days. And then we're gonna see what happens next April, but fingers crossed. Fingers we'll be crossed. Able to do something. Let's leave it at that. Thank you so much, Christine Thora and Elisa, and all of you who tuned in to this uh, broadcast. It's been uh, incredibly, uh, it's been cre incredible fun to to be with you for this hour, for this live streamed literature event, uh, which will surely be available on our Facebook pages. Uh, but uh, for now, we'll say thank you and goodbye.